All right, you ready? Ready. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. And to anyone watching on our guest's channel, I say hello. I'm not super used to being on video, although I do do it for uh, for Chessable's How to Chess show. Um, so you'll get a lot of me staring at an outline, but happy to uh, to uh, welcome uh, newer viewers. So Perpetual Chess, of course, long form interview show, and we're interviewing uh, one of the chess YouTube OGs, originators uh, this week. He's a FIDE candidate master, longtime chess YouTuber, been making videos since 2007. He's known on YouTube, of course, as King's Crusher. He was one of the most popular chess YouTubes in the world for many years and is still going strong with 114,000 subs last I checked. He's also a computer programmer and the webmaster of the popular site chessworld.net, a site he's been running for well over a decade. Uh, our guest also created the most popular chess course on Udemy, which is called The Complete Guide to Chess Tactics and has a bunch of other courses on there. And he's a, a bullet, self, self-confessed self bullet addict slash specialist uh, who recently achieved his highest lead chess bullet rating at the age of 50. So yes. without further ado, let's welcome him to the show. Um, uh, Tr Trifon Gavriel, a.k.a. King's Crusher, how are you? Fine, good. Yes, I, yeah. I recently had my my fiftieth birthday, and I was pleased that my bullet abilities are still there. Yeah, it's, I think it's like a good test of the brain function if I've still got my uh, speed. So I'm quite happy with bullet chess at the moment. That's amazing to hear. Yeah, and it's great that you you know you celebrate these things. Now, one thing I can't help but wonder hearing you say that you're fifty, uh, Trifon. Here in the U.S., uh, that qualifies you for a bunch of senior tournaments. Is that the case in the U.K. as well? Yes, I will be looking out for them, actually, now that you mention it. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll be on the lookout for that, especially if, um, you know, the uh, the situation, um, you know, with the COVID, you know, settles down a bit. Um, I, you know, I've had um, my, my vaccines. I think I might be eligible for a booster as well. So that, I think I'll, I need to be a bit more reassured, but before going out into the uh, over the ball bowl, because it's quite a lot of people sometimes at a tournament. I don't know... Um, if I'm that comfortable doing over the board chess at the moment, it's usually online chess uh, I prefer at the moment. Yeah, understandable. But sooner or later, hopefully, we'll get this sorted. <laughs> this pesky uh, um, pandemic, and and then uh, yeah, it's something cool. Of one of the good things about turning fifty, I'm forty four, and I'm already starting to think about it. So uh, <laughs> yeah. you, you'll have to um, give me the um, the scouting report. But um, <laughs> but uh, Trayvon, and I'm sorry, I know you already. Told me, I I just think of you King's Crusher. So you before we started recording, you gave me the correct pronunciation of your first name, but I have oh, a feeling I'm bungling it. Can you just say call it again? me Trifle if you want? I don't I don't mind Trifon, Trifle. <laughs> well, no, tri Trifon's good or Trifon's good. Either actually, I, I'm not really that bothered actually. But the the Greek is uh, Drifonas uh, because my parents are from Cyprus originally. Um, so I was born in in England, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's like an ancient Greek saint's name. Some there's actually a some Trifon's day, uh, so Trifon Costas Gavriel. Okay, is, all is right, my, not my not as bad as I feared. But anyway, it just <laughs> <laughs> my my apologies. Not the first name I mispronounced. Don't now, worry about it. <laughs> now, Mister King's Crusher. <laughs> what I would like to start with, of course, is your your YouTube career. I mean, it's it's been amazing. I mean, two thousand and seven. It, I know it's been, you know, obviously well over a decade, but it feels like a century to me. And it's hard to imagine uh, the beginnings of chess YouTube then. So um, I checked out your first couple of videos. One was, I mean, of course, I've been aware of you for a long time, but in preparation for this interview, I, w I went back in the annals and your first one was like sort of live footage from a club. But then your first real video was showing a game. Um, take us back to what you remember about that. What was your thought process um, putting something like that online in those days. I have to give credit to Majnu of 2006. He did a video with a normal video recorder for recording the screen. There wasn't the software like nowadays. I, nowadays, I use something called XSplit. But yeah, he. I, I did find this Microsoft Windows encoder software, though, from Microsoft. So I didn't have to use uh, like a, a video recorder. I, I used uh, yeah Microsoft encoder. And that seemed quite quite good, and yeah, I had experiments with it, you know, on on his encouragement. So I did some videos, and I thought it could actually be good, you know, promotionally for Chess World to do some videos. And um, uh, I was originally just, you know, thinking of just doing master games. I think I did a, an early Fisher game 
the one where Fisher did Queen Takes F4 check, I think, with this yep. um, this Queen sac Yeah, famous Queen Sacrifice, yeah. yeah. And um, and then I think J. Roby Chess, I saw J. Roby Chess doing this live commentary, and I thought, hang on, I, I kind of like doing live commentary, the idea. So I, was, I, I did quite a lot of live commentary videos, and and people seem to really enjoy them. The ICC was the dominant server at that time, uh, so you had to do like Telnet Windows. So I mean, it's it's still a good server, of course, um, but the web browsers, you know, seem more convenient to me now. I I, I usually use uh, web browser servers now, but back in the day, you know, Telnet, ICC, and I was like starting to record, you know, sometimes two or three games each day, and. Uh, do some sort of post mortem analysis as well, and actually, people have been saying for me to get back into to do that. But I've had other sort of ac- adventures and activities actually. But that is that is good component. I do prefer like the tournament format, um, like these bullet tournaments or super blitz is is one of my favourite time controls actually nowadays. Rather than five minute, I think I prefer three minute. It's sort of a mix between bullet and five minute, but. Yeah, that's yeah. Good. It serves people's uh, short attention spans. Three <laughs> minutes seems to be the the way the wind is blowing. Um, and when you started making these videos, uh, were people watching right away, or was it just sort of like a trickle at the beginning? Uh, it, it yeah, it did seem to grow. I think YouTube actually this as it was documented recently. I've seen this um, a few documentary videos by Veritasium actually. Originally, the YouTube algorithm uh, favored you accumulating subscribers. And everyone would be notified originally in the first few years of YouTube. So your subscriber base would help you get more and more views, basically, on each each video. But I think YouTube changed their algorithm at some point with at the time of Google+. And it was more about um, you had to do more attractive um, video thumbnails and descriptions because they wouldn't necessarily notify all your subscribers. So there has been some YouTube algorithm changes along the way. But when the algorithm was just more kind of straightforward that they did notify all the subscribers, I was definitely seeing, you know, increases and increases and increases. But I think YouTube itself is under pressure to compete with other platforms. Everyone's trying to get our eyeballs now. It's been called the attention war. You know, this like Netflix, Facebook, they're all trying to get our attention. And I think YouTube changed their algorithm. I I kind of know from this course I went, this official YouTube course, that they were going to measure watch time. So it's not just if you do a good video, you've got to get your audience to watch other videos. They'll take the total watch time and then they'll prioritize you in their own room. So it's all quite aggressive nowadays for watch time, you know, this kind of view time war that's going on. Um, So uh, I think, you know, Netflix is also in the mix now. So YouTube has got a lot of competitors for our eyeballs. But yeah, when the algorithm was more straightforward, it was easier to build up views and and it's, it's it's kind of there's more emphasis i think now on on uh, the thumbnails and and the sort of more clickbaity descriptions and stuff to get uh the algorithm to be excited to send it to, even to your own subscribers the algorithm's gonna right. think you know it does a sample and then it, based on that sample it will send it to to your subscribers so it's a bit uh, it's it's all about watch time i think nowadays uh, it's more it's more changed yeah, yeah, it's it's fascinating to, I mean, I'm sure it's extremely advanced right now. I know there are sort of uh, professions built around helping people sort of up it, but I'm curious when you were getting started, like, so it was more, as you say, it was a, a sort of pure system where um, if you, you know, if people were responding, uh, it would be sent to more people. But did you feel like people were responding right away or was it initially just sort of like, all right, this is kind of a, a lost leader for chessworld.net, but it's fun and I love chess, so I'll keep doing it. I think it was right away, but also there was even, you know, on the chess servers, there was far less, um, you know, no, no suppliers of chess servers. So there were lots of people also uh, joining straight from YouTube to go to the chess server as well. Uh, so it was it was a time of high traffic because there weren't so many suppliers. Uh, so okay. yeah, it was it was a very interesting time. And one thing I did feel uh, it, for me it was a personal gap that although I I was doing well with Chess World, I really wanted people to chat about games. So I was really quite excited to get this kind of community chat going around historical games. I really kind of liked that as well. You know, it's like very interesting to get this kind of community going on YouTube as well as Chess World. Because Chess World, most people just generally, uh, you know, log in, play their moves, correspondence moves, and then log out. So 
people chatting on games is a bit rare, but because YouTube, uh, you know, like chess games, come is because it's that purpose. You get the audience fully focused on that purpose. So you know, like a chess games, come there's a lot of kibitzing every day, but YouTube is also like the primary goal for kibitz, you know, for commenting. And so that was a very very nice um, need that I personally had. Uh, you know, I like people chatting about chess, so that was really, you know, kind of nice to have that YouTube as well as Chess World going. And I, I still enjoy I really enjoy that as well now. Makes sense. And you mentioned, of course, the chess servers. And as you mentioned, ICC, which stands for Internet Chess Club, was kind of the industry leader at the time. So um, the fact that you were funneling sort of traffic to them in addition to to your own site, were you getting early sponsorship deals or was it just the ad revenue from YouTube, which I know isn't like, especially in those days, wasn't like amazing? I, I didn't really, I wasn't really that strict about, um, because because I felt they were like real-time chess anyway, and I'm doing correspondence, so it wasn't really a direct sort of competitor. I didn't, I just thought it would be a good addition to the YouTube channel content without any major conflict of interest for me so um no i wasn't i wasn't sponsored by them or anything no it's just but eventually i did do some shows for them eventually in in later years that was that was fun so yeah but um it was the auto pairing of icc is especially good to meet titled players a very very strong grandmaster sometimes so yeah it's it's you know it's a great great site still is but um the, the browser base, I think people, more, more than consumers, they want convenience. Um, they want minimal hassle nowadays for things. So that's the way I think the world at the moment, just uh, taking out yeah. the hassle. Yeah, with the auto pairing, what uh, Trifon is referring to is, believe it or not, listeners and viewers, in the in the old days, you had to sort of like seek a certain game in a certain rating range. And then like the person would have to like manually look to see if they fit the criteria, whereas now there's what they call rating pools, where you just hit three minute on chess.com or Lee Chess and, or ICC, and, and it finds you a game. Um, fascinating um, how far we have come. Now, Trifon, of course, you've got this background as a computer programmer, and you made uh, your site, chessworld.net. Um, were you doing chess full time already in these days, like 2007, or were you doing other programming on the side? Um, I was... I, I did work in industry, so my degree is computing and business. So I started off with quite uh, an IT, uh, quite an intense IT consultancy. I was working every day of the week. I remember getting electrocuted one weekend with, with one of the machines. Oh my that was that. So, so that wasn't. Uh, then I, I worked for another company. I worked for finance, and then there was this merger, and I had this opportunity. Do I want to set up my own company, or do I want to work in another sort of finance company? And I thought, hang on, this is a good opportunity to see if I can set up my own company. So I, I did set up uh, Chess World, but I had been um, programming some of, you know, the chat mate detection while I was still working for this finance company. I had these emails, hang on, it's not, it's not registering chat mate here. So I did have bugs, while I was, but eventually I managed to sort out chat mate detection. And yeah, it's people did seem to want to pay uh, the annual fee. I was, you know, charging, it's not much. Uh, uh, and it, it, it and I have been doing chess world ever since. I haven't needed to go and work in IT. I do prefer being self-employed. I don't particularly like going on the London underground and all the hassle of getting up early and having to work late. And sometimes there's an image of conscientiousness. You don't need that if you're self-employed. So I, I kind of like doing my own thing. And um, my brother's also, you know, uh, an IT person, self-employed. And my family generally, they had a clothing business um, you know, Mary Gavril in, in London, and that was very, very successful. So the entrepreneurial spirit to do our own companies was kind of, I think it was, it's like encouraged in my, my family. I, so, but anyway, I have sort of seen a few industries, I, you know, IT consultancy, manufacturing. I worked at Dexion and I worked at, you know, UBS in, in finance in the city. So I've, I've seen that, I've seen mergers and it's, it was very, very interesting, but I've never been, uh, by the way, a professional chess player. My, I, I always thought I was going to be a programmer, but in later years, you know, I set up, you know, Chess World, and it's been fun ever since, really. Um, you know, it flies by when you're having fun, as they say. It has been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed um, Chess World. And yeah. Go ahead. The, the ICC community, I don't know if you remember, there was this book by Sarah Hurst, Chess on the Web, but the ICC, I thought, was totally out of my reach to program anything like the ICC. But I did know day spaces from my work in IT. So I was good at day spaces. 
And my brother said, uh, my brother Nick one day said, you know, do you know you could store a possession in a database? I thought, hold on. Does that mean that I could do correspondence chess? Because in correspondence chess, you just need to like store the possessions. So you can have like 200 games and you just store like the latest possession and, and the PGN. And that was within my capabilities rather than real-time chess. So my, my technology skill set did seem to match up with being able to program chess world. It's more about the, the day space side of things. And um, I, I could just about do do the uh, the wiring needed. So <laughs> the legal moves and all the stuff. And it grew, you know, the tournaments, there's tournaments, knockout tournaments, um, pyramids, um, uh, and other, you know, quite interesting features at chess world, which people seem to appreciate. Uh, amazing stuff yeah you're a true pioneer so when was when was your last uh non chess job when did you switch to to doing your content creation and chess world full time non chess job the last well, it was when i was working at uh, U- ubs um and actually when i was there at ubs i did actually play someone who beat me in one of the uh, games i was playing i was playing <laughs> quite a few people that sort of helped test the early chess world and I actually annotated that game actually on Chessworld because Chessworld also has this annotated games area. It's quite so. Yeah, that was my last thing, just working in the city in, in a big finance company. Um, so, what year do you think that was? Actually, I don't know now. Actually, yeah, uh, I, was, I think it was. Well, let's, let's tackle again. it this way. Your first video was two thousand and seven. I'm guessing it was after your first video. A few years before that, I think. I oh, think wow. YouTube was like two years, two years later. Or so, uh, one or a few years later, I was in YouTube. This guy Matt Maginu, two thousand six, an early Chess World member, mentioned about YouTube. So, yeah, two years, yeah, yeah was sometime later, I got into YouTube. Okay, and um, and before we move to to other topics, Trifon, I do I want to give a quick shout out to a friend of the pod, Chess.com, Sam Copeland. I don't know if you've seen his time lapse videos of the most popular chess YouTubers over time. Oh right, yes, uh, yeah, those are those are amazing. So of course I watched uh, a couple times to sort of take a trip down memory lane and uh, <laughs> prepare for the the video. So it looked like you know from 2007 when you launched to say 2014 before. Um, before the Agadmaters and Levy Rosmans yeah, and uh, yeah. people started to emerge, it looked like you were near the top. Uh, Jerry from Chess Network has been at it forever. Uh, the chess website, Mato Jelic, uh-huh. um, the Canadian guy who streamed his games, whose name you said something, Roby? I'm sorry, I forgot Jay, it. Already. Oh, oh, no, oh, there was Jay Roby Chess. There was Maju 2006. Uh, there was, uh, yeah, there was quite a few. Um, Green Castle Block. I mean, yeah, there was quite quite a few uh, interesting channels. There was even this, uh, I think this Icelandic GM who specialised in three minute chess. He was playing a reverse Dutch uh, Leningrad. I think uh, yeah, he had a, he had a pet system. He was there. There were some strong players around uh, at the time. It was it was a very very interesting uh, time, definitely. For, and for YouTube. did you consider yourself competitive with these other uh, chess YouTubers? Would you be like trying to be the number the number one or top three or whatever it might be in those days? Um, I'm, I'm, I, <laughs> I think I like views as long as my videos got a few comments. So <laughs> I think I didn't mind um, because my main my main. Um, uh, you know, as far as income anyway, you know, chess world. So it was just a bit of, it's, it's still a bit of a, a hobby on the side, you know, to do videos. It's a bit of fun, maybe a bit of marketing. But I did find that the um, the Google AdWords uh, actually was the big thing to do marketing. You know, Google AdWords. Yeah. Very, very strong, uh, you know, more than 10 years ago. And it, there was this time when it actually, the YouTube uh, members actually exceeded what I was paying with Google AdWords. So there's this time when your work in social media can actually be stronger than the paid marketing you do to Google AdWords. So I remember that time, this very strange transition time. And um, so I was feeling like one of my uh, admins was saying, oh, I, I miss, I'm wasting a lot of time on YouTube. I could just be, you know, but it was actually good marketing time in the end, you know, and and also a little bit of income started accumulating on YouTube. So it was like, you're putting in the work, you're getting a bit of separate income and you're also like marketing, you know, this, you know, my chess world. So it seemed to be two birds with one stone. And also I did like the comments, you know, on games and stuff. And 
So that is, it was, uh, it was very beneficial to get into YouTube. It was, def- it was definitely a very, very important uh, marketing tool. It started to be more powerful than Google AdWords. So that was very interesting as well. That's interesting. Yeah. So you build a sort of a flywheel that supports itself uh, and still doing it to this day. But, uh, but Trifon, I want to get into, of course, you've made, you know, so many chess sort of history videos, so many famous games. And I know that you're a particular fan of uh, Fisher and Tal and Morphe. So I want to kind of dive into to those players and chess improvement. But first, Trifon, we're going to take a break and uh, hear from our sponsors. Um, Okay, and and we are back. And uh, Trifon, so here on Perpetual Chess, uh, supporters of the podcast uh, can submit questions for our esteemed guests, and um, we've got a few good ones from for you. So my first question is from Mark Miller. So Mark Miller, thanks for uh, helping to support Perpetual Chess. And Mark wrote in to say, uh, Trifon, your interest in and coverage of Bobby Fischer has been remarkable. Have you read John Donaldson's works on Fisher? And given your mutual interest, have you ever had any correspondence or conversations with him about Fisher? I've got an Audible uh, book and other Fisher books, um, actually by Brady. Sorry, my Fisher book here is by Brady, actually. Um, Endgame, right? Or uh, Profile of a Prodigy? Just Bobby Fisher. Um, Yeah. Yeah. but no, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure uh, about uh, th- about Donaldson's book. It's definitely um, worth checking out. It came out about last last year, um, and uh, I should mention, by the way, Trifon's two most popular videos of all time are both about Bobby Fischer, the uh, the game of the century, and uh, Fischer Petrosian. Um, <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> but I have to tell you something funny about the the, the Fisher Petrosian. Uh, I I was a bit because so Petrosian is also one of my favourite players because I think he's quite peculiar. He hated losing, and I think we're privileged now to be able to select Petrosian's wins. But I think um, people at the time probably were not amazed by Petrosian because he would draw a lot of time com- com- compared to Spassky, uh, which was good for winning. Uh, you know the the place for the world championship but Petrosian has always fascinated me as well and I kind of went into an overkill mode this is mm. quite funny because I, I probably I definitely did a lot more analysis than I normally would and I think I drove the YouTube algorithm nuts because actually I, I did get a lot of people say you've done too much analysis there were too many variations here but <laughs> it drove ended up strangely driving the YouTube algorithm completely berserk so it was getting more and more shown in YouTube, and I was getting more and more kind of comments about how I did an overkill analysis. So it doesn't really work how you uh, kind of anticipate. It started with, okay, I wanted to do this game, but I, I kind of overdid the game. But yeah, you can sometimes, it's about, you know, I didn't mean to. It just shows there is an underlying algorithm. You can sometimes, even without knowing it, you can excite the algorithm for the wrong reasons sometimes. So <laughs> what, a lot of my Fisher games, they're much briefer, the analysis are more to the point. But, and that was just the draw as well. So at the end of this big analysis, it's just the draw as well. Right. I, nowadays, I don't even cover draws. I like covering the size of games. And my preference now is, is actually for shorter games right now because... It means a shorter video, and I, I think I, I have a, more of a feeling that I, I don't want to sort of burden uh, the uh, this onus of seeing a huge video. And people sometimes only have a few minutes, and so I can appreciate. I think I prefer videos to be like ten to fifteen minutes now. But at the time, I, th- I just went overboard, and it accidentally drove the algorithm nuts. So by driving <laughs> it nuts, you mean it it promoted it in a lot of places and that's yeah. part of why it has so many views yeah because of all the comments which weren't particularly great comments so it's quite that was a funny case uh, but there are I, I noticed other strange algorithmic effects um if if i i noticed at one point if you used you know some word like outrageous it would also kind of drive the algorithm nuts or secret and yeah there's a lot about playing the algorithm, but I, I, I think um, I prefer not to play any algorithms because in an extreme case, and this is ridiculous, um, Cora, I, I noticed that it promotes the bigger answers and it's not good at the end of the day just to be playing algorithms because you could pad out these answers with lots of positions, but why would you want to at the end of the day? I think 
the purer thing for me is you, you want to add value to yourself and other people. You don't want to be playing algorithms. That's my point of view now. So I'm, I'm very happy with the Lee Chess blogs because you can quickly show a game, not diagram by diagram, quickly show a game and the insights, and it's good for you and it's good for other people. And that's also why I like... I'm, I like doing courses at Udemy because I want to go for a few games for myself as much as anything each day, not just one game and then having to market this thing and package it and all that. I just I just want to add value either to myself or people watching. I don't want to be playing algorithms, but I did notice sometimes these algorithmic effects, sometimes completely unintended. That's funny. <laughs> Completely unintended. Yeah, yeah, it's a con <laughs> constant struggle for creators. Do you do you try to please the algorithms or just make what you think is good content? And you know, trying to strike that balance is uh, always challenging. Now, you mentioned the Lee Chess blogs. That's something we should give a shout out to because obviously, Lee Chess amazing free website, as everyone watching and listening knows. But th they may not have caught this new feature because I think it was only launched within the last month. Um, basically just an easy way for a chess player to write a, write a blog post and embed a video. Um, and Trifon's been, been going hard on the, <laughs> on the, uh, the chess blog posting frequently. So um, wh what drove you to start doing this? It seems like you're busy already with your content. Why did you decide to embrace this uh, new way of sharing? I, I, I thought I should give it an experiment to see what happens. And then I started noticing, hold on a sec, hold on a sec. This is a good promotion tool. And also I started, you know, it's allowed to put videos as well. And I've, I've realized, I mean, this is very, very new, that it also drives some traffic to some old videos. So I've got these thousands of videos lying there. And I did, you know, check, and it, it does seem to promote old videos. So I probably don't even need to do any more, more YouTube videos. I could just talk about some of my old classic videos. So that's another thing for any, any YouTubers listening that, if you if you do a blog, you can include a video and talk about you know the game. You can do a study as well, and include that and put the analysis. and It makes a nice package, so you can have study, video, commentary around it. It makes a nice, you know, like when you go to an exhibition, you've got the artifacts which are neatly kind of annotated and packaged. It's a, a, a blog post really can encapsulate well a lot of media. I do think it's a fantastic medium. If you've already got uh, content elsewhere or videos, I think I would recommend checking out the Lee Chess blog. Huh. Uh, and Feeble is a, is a really one of the best programmers and nicest persons I've ever met, uh, you know, online in my life. He, he's really responsive to any changes and, and stuff. He's a brilliant guy. Yeah, yeah. Shout out. You're talking about Debo, I assume. Oh, Debo Debo, 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 yeah. Yeah, just amazing. Amazing. Just amazing. Incredible product. Um, so let's bring it back to uh, Fisher and Morphe. So, I, so where does uh, where does your fandom? I mean, it's you know any chess any chess fan. It's it's not hard to guess how you might become like devoted to them. But but what is it about Fisher and Morphe and Tal uh, that that makes them sort of your favorite player and to have made so much or amongst your favorite players and to have made so much content about them, Trifon? Well, I think um, there's two sets of world champions, very broadly speaking, the dynamic, aggressive, tactical world champions and the more kind of static, positional world champions. And Morphe, as an unofficial world champion, strikes me, um, you know, very, very strong, tactical, dynamic, aggressive, and could even give odds games, could even play blindfold simultaneouses. His tactics and combinations are absolutely, you know, out of this world. And also, I think there's a an underlying uh, win probability drive to both Morphe and Fisher. They will sometimes, if they're losing, and, and Morphe can be losing because he's, he's given odds of Rook and Knight, they will find ways and means of creating win probability. And that is also a fascinating thing. Fisher might you know, play on and on and grind people down, even fellow US grandmasters when playing in another country. Uh, you know, They have to suffer free adjournments against Fisher. Fisher's not going to give them a draw, and he carries on to try and get that win probability. So that will to win, I think, is evident in both. And um, But Tal, Tal, for me, is the bigger kind of chess enthusiast. You know, up until a month before he died, he, he apparently, you know, he left a hospital bed to go and play Kasparov in this Blitz tournament and beat Kasparov yeah. just exactly like 30 days before, you know, his death. He played until the very end. And you could see him on the FIDE, you know, rating lists, which are online, um, that he was 
generally in the top 10 and 20, even 20 years after 1960. So for, for me, the biggest like lover of the game, independent of winning or losing, just to create, you know, be involved in chess is Mikhail Tao, I think. Uh, so I think I'm more in love with Tao since working on Tao in the last few weeks uh, than ever before. And also he was a good friend of Desmetanov, uh, and they had the similar sort of dynamic, creative style and, and bronze thing. I, I consider there's this certain group uh, that were very much chess um, enthusiasts as well. And Tao would play anyone, even if you know they weren't an official grandmaster in, in Blitz or whatever. So I think Tao's currently my, my favourite. But I, I love uh, all of them. And, and, the, and Morphe, you know, was so ahead of his peers. I, I think... It, that contrast that he was so ahead uh, makes it easier to see some opening principles if they're violated. Uh, what is the punishment for violating opening principles, like moving the same piece twice, like being materialistic? I started to see, uh, you know, a lot of Morphe's opponents, it's like their pieces literally haven't got out of bed in the morning, yeah. all on the back row, the king's in the centre. So you start to see these things very clearly from the, the contrast in Morphe games between, because he was so much stronger than his peers. Um, unfortunately for Morphe, chess was seen as a form of gambling. I could understand, get some empathy that he didn't want to carry it on. And he, he failed this law practice to restart it or start it or restart it because people just came in and wanted to talk to him about the chess, it seems. So yeah, for Morphe, unfortunately, he was too early for chess, I think. Yeah. What, what stands out to me about Fisher and Morphe in particular, as you say, is is how far ahead of their peers they were. I mean, Morphe mm. to a greater extent, but I think at the time that Fisher, his brief peak, it was probably harder harder to do because uh, mm. players were so much stronger. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned the dynamic style, Trifon, and I know that you kind of, you you like the tactical chess as well. Um, when I recorded uh, the Seven Tedley Chess Sins recap with uh, David Franklin um, about uh, Jonathan Rousen's book, you, you had messaged me and said that you had been playing around with a sort of safe style as a mm. way to, to improve your game. Could, mm. could you uh, expound on that a little bit? I don't know if you remember this little experiment that you described to me online, but I'm curious to hear about it. I, I think I, I think I was getting this inkling about win probability more and more. Actually, I think it was that I, I think I was playing Mamadjarov in Blitz, and there's this option: do you play objectively, or he's low on time? So you factor the clock in as well, and I like try and keep the checks going, and you know play non-controversial moves sometimes. So I think uh, you, you know you can have all the strategies in the world, but I think they're plugged into like win probability, uh, even even. Art, the art of war if, if you consider one of my favorite uh, philosophies is put yourself beyond the feet before going on to the attack but in certain examples of, of Sun Tzu he would like go on to the attack because he knew that the army is numerically you know bigger so he got to chip away at them so it's all about the win you know not it's not about the strategies the strategies are just a tool a means to an end and I think that that shines through more and more when you see, uh, you know, Morphe and Fisher. Like Fisher would sometimes, you know, against certain opponents, avoid main, you know, opening theory because he knew his opponent would be a researcher and would know all of this and play something obscure. And in Blitz, you know, Fisher would totally change his repertoire because he knows that against Tao, you know, he should keep a really solid opening. He played some weird hybrid of G3 and, and the London system and beat Tao. So he knows about, to me, it seems their main thing is, is as simple as maximizing win probability. Any, anything, um, you know, any strategies we, we fall in love, love with, I think they're always going to be subservient. Uh, if if we, we want to be competitive, at least, they're always going to be subservient to maximizing your probability of winning. So, you know, on the faster time limits, you know, just moving quickly can be the best strategy. So I, yeah. I think I see that more and more, though. That, and, and Lasker, you know, he was largely understood not very understood, but I think he would factor in the psychology of opponents and adjust his play accordingly. Yeah, famously. Um, that, that's interesting. So you you feel like you're able to sort of in, incorporate that uh, in, into your own sort of uh, online game? 
yeah, on, on my stream um, template, I do actually put win, maximize win probabilities and tell people about it. It is one of my favorite. It's a, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a bleeding the obvious strategy. Basically, you want to win, and everything should be subservient. But it's easy to sort of uh, try and be, for example, too positional, or too accurate. You know, the clock is part of the game, especially in online chess and, and, and speed chess. That's also to be factored in. And sometimes I think Tal, you know, with his complexity, uh, you know, drive, he would also recognize, look, um, you know, people are, are human beings. I don't know if you know the hippopotamus story of Tal. It's quite funny. I don't believe so. Oh, right. Apparently, you know, he'd spent 40 minutes, you know, it looked as though he was calculating for 40 minutes, but apparently... Oh, great. Yeah, Go thinking on, about how to get a, a hippo out of a swamp. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I thought it was very, very interesting what he said, you know. Uh, and after that, he, he realized when he came back to the board, he gave up because all of his engineering expertise, you know, it, it failed him. He couldn't get this hippo out of the swamp. And he said, well, you know, the nature of the problem here, it's, it, it's intuitive. So, you know, he just plays the night sack anyway. Right. And, it, and, and to me, that is, um, yeah, so, you know, sometimes chess isn't uh, scientific. It, you know, it is about winning. It's about psychology. And, and sometimes even complications can be a, a weapon for you to win games. If, as Tell says, if you lead your opponents to a deep, dark forest where two plus two is five and a path is only narrow enough for one, you know, the complexity itself becomes a tool for maximizing winning probability. So if there's a trend for all three, you know, they are warriors. You know, it's a sport for them. You know, they want to win as well. It's not just a scientific set of moves it's against particular opponents in particular time limits taking all all the variables and seeing you know what will win here in this situation yeah i had forgotten about that hippopotamus story of course when uh when sam cope the aforementioned sam copeland and i uh talked about my life in games um <laughs> on the podcast we we had mentioned that story just just legendary stuff um yeah um so we have a Patreon question sort of relating to this swashbuckling style, um, which is from Joe Salmon. Uh, thanks for the support, Joe. And Joe asks, he says, uh, what are your thoughts on the chess opening the King's Gambit? He believes it's a favorite of yours. Do you think it will ever feature again at elite level standard time controls? Uh, and he mentions that Jan Napomnici did recently play it in an Armageddon game. Um, well, Levin Aronia, I remember, he was talking about the King's game. The problem is there are so many things that black can do to get a decent position. So your theoretical knowledge is stretched because there are just so many options black has. But I remember a Super Grandmaster game. Uh, Michael Adams was defeated by Nakamura in a King's game in a standard time control. So it can be dangerous. I think the more resourceful um, a Grandmaster is, the more they can make out of it. Uh, it. It is the best gamut as far as being able to get into it, because a lot of gamuts you'll never actually get at the board. You know, you might want to play the martial gambit, but people are going to throw anti-martial moves at you. So it is a kind of, I think it's our gateway into the romantic era of chess just to play the king's gamut. You're giving a nods up. It's, it's a kind of um, nostalgic thing to play. And I did notice my king's gamut playlists you know, was more popular than a lot of my others. Uh, you know, and it, I think basically, uh, for me, it, you know, it's got several features. Sometimes you get better central control. Sometimes you're using the rook, you know, the default position of the rook when you castle on F1, it's automatically developed when you blast through. Sometimes you're causing fragmentation, structural fragmentation, and they're too greedy. I, it worked very well for Paul Morphy. And it also, you know, Spassky beat Fisher with it, of course. And yeah, Nakamura's beaten Adams, but it's kind of heavy going if if you want to be like prepared for all the things that black can do. I think that was Levin Ronian's point. There's just so much black can do to potentially equalize or be slightly better sometimes. Yeah, I, I don't think it'll it's safe to say it'll it will never be prominently featured in the at the elite level, but it raises an important point. Um, friend of the pod, Chris Callahan from the aforementioned Lee Chess, uh, he's been sharing a few sort of um a few nuggets on Twitter recently where he looks at different openings. And of course on Lee chess, you can filter for different ratings. Mm. So when you go to their opening explorer within the study feature, you can filter for like 
1600 rapid or whatever, um, which I think is around the level of a lot of listeners. And he's saying like a lot of what you're, a lot of the openings that you're told are bad perform quite well at that level. Like I remember he mentioned the Danish gambit and I don't remember the others that are mentioned, but I do just want to highlight the point that, that for, for listeners, particularly those rated say below, below 1600 feet a, which would be, I don't know, 18, 1900, uh, Lee chess rapid or whatever it may be like, just because some strong player tells you an opening is bad, doesn't mean that you shouldn't play it. It's, it's more important to look at your own results and you can even, uh, look at the macro results, um, through the Lee chess opening explorer, because a lot of your opponents, uh, with this offbeat stuff will be less prepared. So, and, and it, lastly, of course, uh, also throwing it back to my interview with Chris Callahan, like we're playing for fun. So if these openings are fun for you, like, you know, you're not going to see the King's Gambit other than like a once in a blue moon surprise by uh, Grandmaster Adiban or, or Nakamura uh, at the top level. But that doesn't mean if you're not, if you're enjoying it, you shouldn't play it. Oh yes. I've absolutely felt that all the time. Uh, when I was doing all the blitz games uh, for the ICC, I'll play whatever I wanted because I, my, one of my courses is the Fun Lover's Guide to you know chess openings. I've categorized openings into systems, normal openings, and gambits. And basically, I think there's a place for these three categories. You know, a system is not necessarily bad. Some people say, well, you don't get exposure to different pawn structures if you play the London systems all the time. But the thing is, if you're not spending all those hours memorizing tons of sharp opening theory, you can spend your time on tactics trainer, play some system, get a decent position, and hope to be better than in your middle game and end game. Tactics pervade, you know, middle game and end game. So sometimes I think people are memorizing all the theoretical openings, but it's like uh, you can't take these games that you see Super Grandmasters playing in closed events for your repertoire because it's totally different goals. For me, it's always about having fun first. So when you're playing online, the gambits often in a restricted time control, they make the position easier for you to play and easier for the opponent to blunder. You know, Black Mardema gambit, uh, you know, is a very dangerous gambit, you know, on the faster time control. Smith Mora gambit, which Essamon's, you know, got a book on May Mayhem and Mora. Uh, all these gambits are super fun. And especially the Smith Mora, you know, can you imagine all of those very heavily theoretically prepared Sicilian defense players? You know, they get that. But in online blitz, you know, I've, I've beaten loads of IMs and even GMs, I think, on occasion with the Smith Mora gambit. The time limit, the easiness to play, and the goal, you can't. It's like technology. You know, I see the same in, in technology. People talk about these technologies that Netflix uses. It doesn't mean it's right for small companies. They haven't got millions of pounds to spend on, on the technology. You can't use uh, you know, things from a different context without really understanding, what, you know, where is that from? So, you know, when you see the Super GMs playing a super solid Slav, and, you, you know, if you want online fun, you know, you can play the King's Engine, the Benoni. You can play anything. I mean... You, I think for, for most enthusiasts, the goal is to have fun, not necessarily to become, you know, even a title player or world champion. Like, they just want to have fun. So I think your choice of openings, systems for me, give you more time to practice on your tactics training. Gambits for me, let you experience more tactical positions. So you can actually use openings as a tool, you know, to you know, for systems to get more time for study, for gambits to get those type of positions. But I don't think you need to copy the grandmasters. You just just do whatever gives you the most fun. If if you're not into you know becoming a grandmaster later, I think yeah, that's why I I did this fun lovers guide to chess openings, and it seems to be you know well received as well on on Udemy. That's great. Yeah, and I want to get more into your Udemy courses, Trifon. But first, we're going to take one more break to uh to hear from our sponsors. Uh, and and we are back and uh trifon so you've mentioned your udemy courses i know that one of your courses i believe is the best-selling chess course on udemy uh full stop um uh, so and i've got a patreon question related to it but uh but first um could you walk walk us through how you started uh selling courses there um how did that come about this is could have sounds very strange, but there is a magical book. And I thought it was all hype. There's a book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And it encourages you to work backwards from what you want. And I felt I was becoming a bit of a slave to YouTube. And I thought, hang on, 
I really want to maybe try my hand at courses. Maybe I do want to be a member for some courses. <laughs> so you look in ahead and you say, well, what do you want to achieve? And you kind of work backwards from that. And I thought, hang on, but I, I'm an instant gratification person. This is really hard. If you've been trained on YouTube, you're into instant gratification. You do a video, you get views, you get all this other stuff. It's very hard to do a course if you're into instant gratification. So one of, one of the hard things is uh, to accumulate and, and to, be, to be happy sort of building a product rather than instantly delivering something just to get instant feedback like on YouTube. So there is a different mindset. But I, I do find it now much more rewarding to uh, plot out a very nice structure in advance. And it's like you're attaching, you know, videos. So it's I call it, I think of it like an armada of videos. And so with the tactics course, the the kind of armada was set out. I already had uh, a kind of paper on my bonnet uh, chess club website years back, uh, you know, when it was all just HTML uh, and that was it. You know, I had bonnets like the ICC at the time. But um, I could, ma you know, map out a structure. And I, I did manage to train myself a little bit, you know, in recent months for delayed gratification. So building up a course. And I realized, you know, your, your reputation is online. You've got to try and make it the best possible thing, you know, you can possibly produce because, you know, your reputation is on the line. And so I made it quite, you know, quite chunky, you know, more than 20 hours. And it's a lot of things I've been thinking about tactics o over the years. You know, like I felt Kotov's Think Like a Grandmaster was more like Think Like a Computer, mm -hmm. the Trees of Variations. I thought, hang on, you know, when I'm, 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 I had some coaches, I was thinking, you know, prioritize forcing moves, um, look at downsides. That's one of my favorites. That even before you think tactically about something, you know, that if if no downsides of the opponent's position exists, you know, say they haven't got a weakened king, say they haven't got a weakness here, say they haven't got an unprotected piece. If there's no downsides, there's probably no tactics. So I wanted a completely philosophically opposite approach to Kotor's Think Like Grandmaster, which is basically saying, look, we're humans. And I think Tao respects that as well. As humans, you really want to maximize your use of intuition and, and feeling and not try and calculate like a computer. Because a computer can completely out-calculate any human. You know, in, in like a second, like a computer can see millions of positions. So I tried to, uh, this human approach that, I've kind of emphasized in that tactics course, which is, you know, you start with with downsides quite often and you're trying to s kind of celebrate those downsides. And then you prioritize forcing moves, uh, basically because you want to make it as easy as possible to calculate, uh, you know, ahead. So things like prioritizing forcing moves, check all checks, you know, captures and major threats like threat of mate in one and two, you know, that helps to prioritize uh, forcing moves. And... So that course, philosophically, is about our limitations as a human. What do we need to do to be good tactically? It's a bit of a magic trick that even like the most outrageous forcing moves, um, I think Cecil Purdy, the, the first um, uh, correspondence world champion, he said that you know to the same sort of effect. Even the most outrageous moves, if they're forcing in nature, it means you can calculate them more easily in advance. There's less branching. So, yeah, I, I put it all together in that course. I, I love creating the structure and I love like, attaching videos after. It's a completely different delayed gratification experience to YouTube. And I did feel like I, I have to sacrifice like YouTube a little bit, you know. <laughs> but I've, I've been getting back into YouTube more recently. But, yeah, it's a completely different experience building a course. Uh, yeah, you've got to delay, you know, gratification and, and build structure in and – yeah, it's been a lot of fun, though. It's been very, very rewarding once you can get, you know, a nice course put together eventually. Very rewarding. That's great. Yeah, and you you have several. And like you say, the, the tactics guide, over 20 hours of content, which is crazy to me. So I, I want to dive into uh, Jim Sadler's question. So uh, first of all, Jim, thanks for supporting Perpetual Chess. And uh, Jim wrote in to say that Trifund's Udemy tactics course is fantastic. It was the first chess le learning resource I found on online during lockdown last year before I even knew Chessable existed. When calculating tactical sequences during a game, does Trifun have any tips for seeing the board in the mind's eye? Visualizing the board and the moves being made is something which it's really hard to find learning resources for for 1,200 players, 1,200 rated. 
You know what? Uh, yeah, I, I, I just um, sometimes, <laughs> and this, I, I, I sometimes think that my calculation and visualization, especially when you play over the board chess, you know the highest stakes the game is. Uh, I, I'm probably because I'm a bad loser sometimes, and this this has affected my dad as well, and that's why he he gave up chess um, at some point. He would keep thinking about a game that he he lost or even won, and he wouldn't sleep. And I think that mm-hmm. also helps train your visualization and calculation. Being a bad loser can actually help train your visualization. You can't get games out of your head, basically, or, or reading books, uh, trying to read notation increasingly without uh, a set. Or looking at analysis, uh, yeah, I think or solving puzzles online can help visualization. Um, but I think higher state games have this role because you, you know you're doing a lot of soul searching. And you also, like, if you like me, you, you, you're not able to sleep after. And you're, you're analyzing a lot of variations in your head, and 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 sometimes uh, I remember one of my early tournaments, uh, Halifax. Um, I I, I pl- when I was about one four seven BCF, there was the the British Chess Federation rating, not ECF, that was later. But I remember um, Rayner going by car with Rayner, and we, we were having a, a blindfold game, and he was sort of impressed. This was years back with my visualisation. I think I've, I have had it from an early age, so I'm not really sure how I got it, except maybe I was a bad loser or something. I just, I just maybe I was calculating a lot more after games had finished. I, I'm not entirely sure how... Uh, that occurred maybe also reading books if, if you can't be bothered to get a chess set out sometimes reading books a bit without a chess board can help visualization yeah there are, there are many different ways i think i think the conventional way is just solving um ta- tactical puzzles online like the harder and harder ones and try not to um guess the move but try and see the whole solution and variations and you know resourcefulness from the opponent as well. The more you can do that all in advance, then that would simulate a real game. Because in a real game, you're not guessing the next move. You have to be able to follow it up. So I think the more you do um, take seriously uh, you know, solving a puzzle, not just quantity, but quality. So you, you try and make sure you've got all the variations worked out in your head before you commit to that next move in that puzzle training thing. I think that would be good as well. Yeah, which is why a lot of people recommend using books, puzzle books, even if it's a similar level. The fact of having a pen and paper, like uh, Grandmaster Jakob Agard says, you you have to do it in a book, and better with a chess set, but even if it's just working from the book, the fact of writing down the answer and writing down multiple moves, and actually this is what uh, FM Peter Giannatos was saying about his new Ultimate Chess Workbook. Um, it sort of... Uh, you know, forces a mechanism of accountability that is harder to come by if you're just clicking buttons on the tactics trainers, which of course are great resources uh, if you can be disciplined. Um, A couple other recommendations for Jim and anyone interested in the same topic as Jim. I've mentioned these before, but just give a quick plug to uh, Benedictine's Visualize courses on Chessable. Um, They're kind of unique in that they'll say, they show you a position and then they'll say, okay, Black played pawn takes pawn, white played pawn takes pawn, black played knight f3, where's the tactic there? So instead of looking at the tactic in the given position, he's forcing you to look ahead a move or two and find a tactic in a, in a move further down the road. And he's got, Benedictine has like a bunch of uh, a bunch of those so that they get progressively harder as you go. And then I often recommend uh, step two, thinking ahead uh, from the chess step series. So that's like a $10 book with all these sort of uh, visualization puzzles. But as Trifun says, some anyone who learned chess younger, it comes easier to them. So um, Jim, I know it can be um, it can be daunting and it takes a lot of work. It's kind of like uh, learning a language as as an adult. It's just tough, but you've got to you've got to lay the foundation first. So uh, stick with it. But um, certainly, I know it's a it's a struggle. And even little stuff like the uh, chess.com board trainer, I think I mentioned before, just clicking on the square just so that you can become as facile as you possibly can with at least like being able to identify a square quickly, stuff like quizzing yourself on how, you know, uh, how a knight gets from H1 to A8 without looking at a board. Um, there's there's lots of stuff you can do, but it's all it's all hard work, unfortunately. Oh. Uh, go on. Oh, but I, I would like to point out something from my tactics course and i did notice this really helped me for solving puzzles uh you know when you're looking to prioritize forcing moves that does help you see further ahead because there's less branches 
But I think to see the opportunities at every half move, so I call this like weakness of the last move. So as an example, if a knight moves from G1 to F3, if it's in a game, you might say, well, the, the knight has neglected E2 and H3. So visually, those squares should really light up. Can a rook come to E2? Can a queen come to A2 or H3? Because these are the golden opportunities in the analysis which emerge dynamically, that weakness of the last move, I call killer common squares. You want to look out for the cooperation. So you've got a bishop on a8 looking at g2. Can you get a rook to look at g2? You know, common squares, they usually win games, basically. And also the liberational effects, especially pawns, if they move in the center, all of a sudden, hold on, this rook's looking over there, this bishop's looking over there. So those three things I've actually called like three golden <laughs> principles. And it's really helped me to solve any puzzles that when you look ahead, basically, weakness of the last move, killer common squares, liberational effects. I've talked about those uh, as the three golden principles that I, I use and I still use. But that's within the context of prioritizing forcing moves. Because as I say, I think you'll be wearing yourself out if you do try and look at all these branches, which might never happen. So I think, you know, look for most people, I think looking at forcing variations as a priority. Awareness, no, not always to play forcing moves, but to be aware at least of the forcing variations, I think is going gonna, is gonna to boost people's uh, rating significantly. But paying attention to those golden opportunities, every half move or play, that, you know, what has actually occurred here? This bishop's gone from e4 to h1, so it's not controlling, you know, this square and this square. And so you look at those golden opportunities, and that seems to serve me very well at the faster time limits online, at, at least, in casual play. Yeah, it's a great point about sort of uh, looking looking at what you leave behind with every move. It's an especially important, obviously, with pawn moves. But as you say, even with peace moves, it's, whatever square was covered might not be covered anymore. Now, I noticed, Trifon, in hearing you describe your course, that you've sort of developed a language around it. Is that something that comes naturally to you, or do you work at that to try to make the material more accessible? I think as a programmer, I think I've... I, I won the Lloyds under 18 in 1989, and I think I was trying to program myself to play better and better chess. The problem is, for years, I don't think I was getting anywhere. I, I basically had this idea, I, I, I'll treat the pieces like resources. And in that tournament, I, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll try and use my, my best resources around the opponent's king. And as a sort of formula. <laughs> and unfortunately, I, I don't think I really improved in rating. I did win that one. I didn't improve in rating significantly. In recent years, I'm more about, um, more. I, I realize chess is super rich as a game and more treating chess for me now as sort of downsides, uh, you know, exploiting downsides. That's my kind of new formula. But it's like I've treated chess as a kind of, maybe an exercise in, 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 finding some formula but there isn't chess is such a rich game and that's what makes it so beautiful that you can't formularize you can't find this golden thing there, there is there is advice but it's all dependent on the position as they say it, it all depends but it's so it's a, it's it's very very hard game but that's what makes it so beautiful and challenging if it was like noughts and crosses you know then forget it you know there wouldn't be all these thousands millions of books and stuff so that's what also makes chess beautiful it's it's so challenging you can't really create your own kind of formulas but probably i what i did find useful i did put into the tactics thing which which do seem concretely you know useful and less controversial more what i called they would scale up to stronger and stronger opponents because if you if you do improve your accuracy on puzzles then if you were in that position even against a gm you should still be able to win if you play the right combination so there is stuff which is what i call like scalable to any opponents, yeah. So I think to look out for that as well, that, you know, sometimes um, one learns bad habits from, say, blitz chess, and you, you will never really improve, uh, you know, when strong opponents, they'll bypass whatever worked at some level, and it's not scalable. So you're going to have stuff which is, like, scalable to whatever opponent, ideally. But on, on the faster time limits, you might take those risks anyway and not really care if you lose, as long as you have a fun game uh, that's that's another approach as well
Yeah. And hearing you describe you were you were stuck for a while. And now, as you mentioned, you're pushing new bullet highs. Now, bullet is obviously sort of its own animal when it comes to chess improvement. A lot of it is just like uh, reflexes, sort of chess reflexes. But it's still impressive for a 50 year old to to attain a new high, especially someone who's, you know, longtime bullet addict played for many years. Hmm. So what to what do you attribute your recent success, Trifon? Um, I think Tal's made me more aware i think i've it's like doing a more systematic finessed investigation when i say about weakness of the last move for example it seems you know in one tail game it's ridiculous the opponent moves a rook to take a knight from c8 taking on c3 and it seems to me tells really factored in the rook's just weak in f8 and there's some other subtle stuff going on and he manages to exploit the f8 somehow and i think he's totally wired in so any type of weakness of the last move, if it's a self-deflection, basically, that'd be like a self-deflection, as if you know you deflected it, but they did it themselves, or a self-pin, or self, you know, unprotected piece, any type of self-destruct move, he seems to be completely wired in uh, to that. You know the Tartico quote that the blunders are all there waiting to be made. Right. So it's like he's created this infrastructure, massive infrastructure, for for tapping into that complexity as a weapon. In programming, it's like the opposite philosophy nowadays. You know, when you program computers, your code's meant to be readable, simple to understand. You know, the complexity is like, you know, it should be zero. You know, you shouldn't have any complexity. But Tal's using complexity as a weapon, and he's creating these, you know, the blunders are all waiting to be made. And he's totally wired in, it seems, to exploit them. So he's made more acutely aware. But also, you know, soft spots, what? I found really strange is that from any opening, even the English opening or Queen's pawn, you know, Queen's game, whenever he does a move like Queen C2 or Queen B3, you know, don't think of that as positional. You know, he's thinking about H7 all the time right. after all the B6. <laughs> all the soft spots. Basically, it's like he's he's looking, you know, those hot spots are really hot in his mind. I'm getting the impression now that the hot spots around the game, anything where there's something expensive like the king or the queen protecting something else, Tal is ready to dismantle that, undermine that, get rid of the defender. He's totally on the ball, basically, for hot spots, for weakness of the last move, uh, making sure that he, he considers a crime to draw with white. So quite often he'd you know, have a disadvantage. You know, even in the World Championship of 1960, you know, one of his favorite moves, this F4 move, you know, he'll have a positional disadvantage, but it avoids this line where he would have exchanged queens. If the queens come off, there's less complexity, less problems for the opponent to solve. Botvinik couldn't solve the problems, couldn't refute this F4, and eventually played this disastrous move, and Aaron Rook takes A6 later in one of the classic games. But you can see sometimes he's even willing to trade off, you know, positional aspects of position to get the complexity and he's totally with it to, you know, exploit those blunders when they are made. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's a bit like Lasker. And Lasker, apparently, he was impressed by Lasker. The funny thing about Lasker, by the way, every time I'd put Lasker into the Lee Chess engine, Lasker was incredibly accurate. I can't believe it. Is Lasker yeah. made computer accurate or something? So that's like one of the next uh, players I do want to investigate, actually. Because I, I think the, the, the old masters, that you don't have so much technical opening theory. You can learn the ideas, the ingenuity a lot more freely from the old masters. That's why I, I love looking at them. I, I like to look at Lasker and Alexander Alakine actually next, among other players. Yeah, I recently um, Dan Heisman had tweeted out Ken Regan wrote this paper that's about six or seven years old. I am Ken Regan, who, of course, has been on the show, is an, an expert of... Um, computer chess where he evaluated the rating strength of various world championship matches and it was like 2400s through the 1800s but then like around the time of Lasker there was like this leap of hundreds of points he was just like leaps and bounds stronger than uh even peers that played within his lifetime and then from there uh, everyone sort of maintained that level going forward from Capablanca on down. But it was just amazing to see just like kind of the, the leap forward that chess made in that period. Um, now, a couple follow-ups because uh, it's fun hearing you sort of uh, wax uh, wax philosophical about Mikhail Tal and Lasker and stuff. So seeing sort of Tal's instinctive attacking style, um, you think that helps you even in one-minute chess? 
I try and play generally as if it's a long game and just faster. I think that's something Andrew Tang has mentioned. Just play it as if you're a long game, but faster. But there are certain moments if you're playing against people that are seem to be out to win on time, you've got to keep a certain pace. But you know, one of the things if you can knock them out with a checkmate, then they can't win on time, can they? You end yeah. the war by checkmate. You only win a battle when you win material. So if you do try and checkmate them, but my style because it's more about checkmating. So maybe I, I might be doing better against those. Otherwise, I'd, I'd lose on time if I was trying to win a pull on the queen side <laughs> in a bullet game. I've only got like two seconds left. Okay, I've won the pawn, but I'm going to lose on time. It's good to sometimes go for the king. So maybe my style fits, you know, going for the king, just in case you are playing something that's significantly faster, uh, fast time control. But I, I also like super blitz as well. It's not just <laughs> like. <laughs> and uh, what was um what was your Lee chess bullet? It was a twenty five, twenty six hundred. I'm trying to remember the exact something. Yeah, it's amazing. It's for... in some tournament, but um in the recent Lee chess um titled, I came ranked fifty. I was really happy. I beat four GMs along the way and uh, quite a few IMs. Yeah, I was pleased with that as well. But a lot of that, you know, there is win probability factored in. You know, sometimes you just need to pre-move though in bullet. Yeah. You know, that's, that, as I say, win probability for me is the head of strategy. Anything else is subvert, subservient to it. You know, mm. If you're, if you're playing someone, for example, in a, in a normal game, and you know that they're a dragon expert, a Sicilian dragon expert, they know everything about the Sicilian dragon. You don't, maybe you, you want to play the Swift Warrior Gambit. Maybe you want to change. You don't want to go into the dragon. You don't want to enter the dragon. So you do things generally to try to avoid the opponent's mega strengths and show their weaknesses up. You know, I think everyone is, is aware of increasing their win probability, but maybe you know maybe they can be more consciously aware of that. Of that. But I, I definitely see that in these these great players. Huh. Yeah. Very, very interesting stuff, mm -hmm. Trifon. And when you, um, when you research someone like Tal, or you mentioned Lasker might be next, uh, are you generally reading books about them? Or are you just kind of dig into the database or chessgames.com? I, I, I found, um, I like looking at the shorter games, actually, because, I, well, the Fisher course was a, I, I was looking just at Fisher's wins, no matter how much the length. The problem with that for me now, looking back, is, uh, and I'm working on this towel course at the moment, I, I prefer the shorter games <laughs> because sometimes those Fisher games, they are grinds. They are sport, They are trying to wear the opponent out, you know, like 70s, 80s. They are literally trying to you know, use exhaustion to sometimes win. So but if you pick on shorter games, generally, uh, looking at the wins, not the losses of, of these my like, favorite players, I think they have an, a more intense tactical content. And you can see, you know, like when I say like short games, like less than 25 moves, there's a blunder there which you can kind of inspect, draw some conclusions, maybe a takeaway point or two to yourself. So I like the short games. It feels more like a, you know, a continuous learning model. You can go on to another game after. You might be able to cover, you know, five or six such games in a day potentially. You know, a sort of morning workout with a few hours. I like. I just like the short games now as well. Uh, so uh, that's. I think the tactical intensity and the blunders that you can learn from how they happened, uh, and maybe the you know some of the opening theories are also interesting at the time, and uh, it's, it's still relevant today. Uh, you know, tell some some of the openings, but he will play anything. You know, even from an English opening, somehow he, he gets attacks from it. It's remarkable. It is that is mag magical as well as his magical tactics. How he can go from a positional opening and have this crazy attack later. Excellent. And so, are you going to do a Udemy course on Tal, or is it a YouTube series, or what? what yeah. What are you yeah, yeah. Um, this, um, I think before the end of this month, it should be released. This this course on tell. Yeah, I've been studying some excellent. Yeah, stuff. so so something else for uh, for listeners and viewers to uh, to keep an eye out. And uh, I, we've covered most of the topics I had in mind, Trayvon. But you had mentioned that you played uh, Demis Hassabas, of course, the creator of um, uh, of Alpha Zero and a very strong chess player in his own right. Although he's mostly gone on to. Uh, world changing things um what what was your experience like playing him uh, as when you guys were kids he's an absolute genius i, I remember you know sometimes we, we did play blitz against each other uh, we were playing peter large once who was one of the dominant international masters peter large was winning all of these like sunday quick plays and we were like in consultation and he, he was peter large was killing us <laughs> you know an international master like large you know it was just killing us the gap is just 
gigantic. You know, we were just enthusiasts. But he did play in the British Championship and did well. You know, he was a great player. And uh, he, in some one of his interviews, uh, uh, it's quite funny. I what the the funny one that I I don't know if you've checked out some one of the reasons um, he he kind of I think mentions for for staying away from chess. He had this grueling like ten hour game or something. And then he blundered at the end, and his opponent was really excited to to win. And he, he had this epiphany: "Hang on, there's all these people in the tournament hall. This is a complete waste of brains." <laughs> and yeah, I think I think it was. I think I can understand that perspective. I think you know, you know, modern. Uh, I'm not totally a fan of uh, one day chess because you, there's so much good content as a consumer nowadays. If uh, you know, you look on YouTube, you can you can you can get a, a an understanding of, of so many different things. Uh, I, I and I just I'm more of a casual player. I like my my online chess and to check out you know channels like Forty Two or Half as Interesting or you know Science Channels, Math Channels. Just just get different uh, you know understanding of different domains. I think so, it makes um, for me. I, I I like to be a bit uh, you know more well more well rounded. And um, the, the the IT you know cool, uh, things on YouTube are good. You know. Go to conferences is one of them. There's, there's lots of IT channels, and you know sometimes the principles do seem a little bit relevant to chess. Uh, sometimes as well, um, but yeah, Demis Sapis was a, a you know a fantastic player. He could have easily become an IM or GM. But you know when you when you when you write software, um, as as Bill Gates said, you know once you do a program, you know it can be there. And you know, work a million times. When you play chess, you have to be there in the performance. It's you that's hard coded in the performance. So, you know, the beauty of writing software, I think, you know, is is that you can do systems, and then they stand, you know, without you being there. And I I do like you know programming, uh, you know, computers a bit and quite a bit from from that angle. You know, I, to have to do a performance all the time is is it's a bit like torture increasingly. So I like, I like writing software as well. It's, it's, good, it's good fun. I can understand why he got into um, And he did absolutely fantastic things. Uh, and also, of course, the Stockfish, you know, NN version I've been using to study the Masters does seem a lot more relaxed about losing material. That neural network angle, you know, has been incorporated in Stockfish. So it's much more dynamic and fast, you know, far sighted than it ever has been. So it's a great time to revisit with that neural network technology, which was influenced by, you know, DeepMind for the Leela project. That's all, it's all been great. The open source movement there for these engines, which are so powerful nowadays, you can revisit these old master games and find amazing new variations. No one's like even mentioned before and, and draw some new conclusions, you know, like about form pawns and patterns i like seeing some new patterns which really haven't been you know mentioned before uh, you know strategies so that's yeah as well yeah and Tal's Tal's a good one to revisit in that vein because he he played so um freely you know he was he was so anti-materialistic um you know which of course is how the engines play without the uh the psychological the heavy psychological dose that uh tal injected um, and, you know, hearing you talk about sort of the importance or the your own passion for lots of topics outside of chess, and obviously Demis Hazabas, uh, the world is better, that he went on to find uh, the company DeepMind that created AlphaZero. Um, you you did mention in a message to me, your, you use the word addiction for Bullet. Now, obviously, it's great that you're doing, oh. that you're, you're making new highs, but are there, are there periods where you just feel like you can't stop playing? I mean, I've certainly been there and I'm not even... Uh, like part of the reason I don't really play bullet is because when I do, I can't stop. Oh, uh, well, I, on, on Lee Chess, I like, if I've got time, I like playing in the daily bullet and then I like playing in the, in the daily super bullet straight off that. And I've amassed quite a number of tournament points. I'm actually <laughs> quite high on the leaderboard for tournament points. So this has happened for the last few years. It seems I do get addicted to, I mean, but before that, remember there was, there was Chess Cube before that. Uh, but I think Chesku, unfortunately, because it used that Flash technology, Flash had some security issues. It was going downhill as a technology. So Leechess was a great kind of alternative for me at the time. So I'm very, very glad for Leechess. Because, yeah, bullet chess for me is also, you know, it, it is a lot about intuition. 
And I, I don't think it's an accident that Magnus Colson and the other grandmasters, sometimes they're very, very good at bullet compared to others. I think more about intuition rather than calculation. To me, calculation sometimes, even if, even if you do prioritize forcing moves, it feels more like hard work. With bullet, I think it's more, you can get away with a lot more, you can play a lot more dodgy stuff, a lot more dodgy openings, and just have a lot, you know, a great deal of fun. So, yeah, I, because I, 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 it's, it's, it's actually, I, I feel, a bullet tournament is a bit like Hollow Zone, actually, compared to playing on a long time control. A five minute tournament is like a lot of work to me compared to playing. On a <laughs> That's tournament. funny. Basically, bullets like going on holiday to a bullet tournament. Yeah, and and the intuition is important with a lot of sort of um, these invisible type chess moves, these puzzles where like the hardest part might be just having a move occur to you if it's like putting so, putting your queen somewhere where it, like fisher's queen f4 that we mentioned earlier like once you see the move it's a simple tactic but you have to be willing to to put your queen somewhere right next to the king where it can just be taken you know in order to sort of lower the king further out um but anyway uh Trifon, i feel like we've covered most of the uh major topics anything else you wanted to uh mention before we wrap up no, that's great. Thank you so much for this uh, interview. I really enjoyed it. Thank, and I really enjoy your podcast generally. It's great. Thank you so much for everything. Oh, you my do. pleasure. It's been a lot of fun, and I do want to mention a couple of things. For since we've decided we're gonna, if if there's no technical issues, share this on your YouTube channel. Um, number one for for anyone watching on video, I. I, we just moved my home office. So the reason the room's a total wreck is I haven't put it together yet. So I got my Paul Morphy poster up, <laughs> but nothing else is set up yet. And I wasn't really thinking because normally Perpetual Chess is an audio only podcast. And for anyone coming from Trifon's channel, I encourage you, you could subscribe on YouTube and there are video renderings where it's just a squiggly line and our voices. But generally, the way people listen is on the podcast apps, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, etc. But if you enjoyed this interview, please check us out. And uh, Trifon, on that note, please keep up the excellent work. And uh, it's been a fun uh, trip down chess history lane and uh, chess content history lane uh, chatting with you. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.